Um, man, I'm really, I'm really humbled. I'm honored that you guys on a Friday night, look at you, on a Friday night, you would come out to listen to some guy talk about geeky constitution stuff and who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. Oh, be careful. Last time we did this, the guy turned into the center of Mike Lee. So just be careful. <laughs> you know, pe people have asked me that, and I said, you know what? Well, you'll hear more as we go along. We solve the problem here in Utah or we don't solve the problem. <coughs> Alexander Hamilton, he's the big government guy, right? Alexander Hamilton, and even he says, we may safely rely on the disposition of our state legislatures to erect barriers against the encroachments of the national authority. When they established the Constitution and realizing what they were up against, what they had, had, had dealt with, there were three very fundamental principles that they, that they considered that were the foundations of what they did. The first was they knew it was the nature and disposition of men and governments to amass unbridled power. When we look at what hap what's happening today, it's nothing more than a natural law. It is the nature and disposition of men and governments to amass unbridled power. Our government is doing what governments do, what governments have done throughout history. Understanding that, realizing that, they did some very important things. But let me first talk about the other two fundamentals that were the establishment of our government. Number one was our rights come from God, not from a government and certainly not from a court. Powers to government come from the people. Again, not from a government and certainly not from a court. Those were the fundamentals. So realizing that it's the nature and disposition of men and governments to amass unbridled power, we've got to do something about that, right? You know what it is. We learned about it in eighth grade, eighth grade civics, right? So we've got to have this checks and balances, separation of powers. We've got executive, legislative, judicial. You've talked a lot about education. I wonder why it is that that's all we study in eighth grade civics that that's all we study in high school and college and law school history. But that's pretty much it. But that's not what Madison told us. Again, he knew a thing or two about the Constitution. Madison said in a single republic, you have this separation of powers. And, and the government controls itself by the different, different branches. But in the compound republic of America, however, the power is first divided among two distinct governments and they will control each other. And there was a very important reason, he said, thus providing a double security to the rights of the people. Alexander Hamilton, again, the big government guy, Alexander Hamilton says, this balance of power between the federal and state governments of the utmost importance. The two governments, a certain rivalship will ever subsist between them, preventing the other from overpassing their constitutional limits. I've been told all my life that, that that if there's a problem with power, if there's a problem in government, I've got to go here. That's where you solve the problem. You've got to go here. They're the ones that determine everything. You've got to go to a few men in black robes and they decide everything. What power do I have then, as a state legislator, to be a control, to, to, to prevent the federal government from overpassing their constitutional limits? Right here. Madison also said, it's not just a balance. He said the powers delegated to the federal government are, you guys know this, right? Few and defined. Those reserved to the states are numerous and indefinite. So it's not this. It's not this. It's that. That's it. And then we have that funny thing, the Tenth Amendment. Powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Very, very specific language. Then you have the Ninth Amendment as well. The powers enumerated shall not be construed to deny or disparage others reserved by the people. We kind of skip over that Ninth Amendment. Pretty, pretty critical stuff. I don't think they were prone, as with the oath, as with the, uh, the, the amendments to the Constitution, I don't think they were prone to just throwing words around. So we look back at that oath, okay? Why is that in there? Those who pledge their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor I think that's the kind of oath they expected of state legislators because we're supposed to be the external check. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern, external 
and internal checks would not be necessary. Are we here? Are we living that? Is that, is that, is that why is that not happening? Why are we here? Why are we here? Fourteen trillion dollars in debt. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, unfunded, net present value of unfunded obligations is in excess of $100 trillion. Benjamin Franklin said, think what you do when you run in debt. You give another power over your liberty. Do you realize that of our $11.6 billion budget, $5.2 billion in the state of Utah comes from the federal government? I hate that phrase. I mean, it doesn't, and nothing comes from the federal government. It comes from us, and then they kind of lord it over us, and, and it comes back. $5.2 billion. Now, if you count the amount of loans that pass through the state from the federal government, that number is really $7.66 billion in the best managed state in the nation. Shall we not be the model of what it means to be self-reliant and free? I don't know how these guys did it. They must have had a crystal ball or something. But uh, look what they said about stuff like that. This is Samuel Adams, the father of the revolution. He said, I was particularly afraid that unless great care should be taken to prevent it, the Constitution in the administration of it would gradually but swiftly and imperceptibly run into a consolidated government, pervading and legislating through all the states, not for federal purposes only as it professes, but in all cases whatsoever. Such a government would soon totally annihilate the sovereignty of the states, so necessary to the support of the Confederated Commonwealth, and sink both of them into despotism. Where's the line? We drew that already. We may safely rely on our state legislatures to erect barriers against the encroachments of the national authority. We've never stood at that line. We, 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 we draw a line and say, we really mean it. Don't you cross that line. And then we go back here and say, don't you cross that line. You know what I mean. <laughs> We've been at this for 100 years. We can't expect to turn it around tomorrow. We've been learning that, that that is the checks and balances of our government. Our lawyers and our judges and our politicians and all of us. We can't get frustrated and upset with our politicians when they're only acting upon the knowledge that they have. We need to take our leaders and ourselves and our neighbors where they are and help them understand. Help them understand that that is what we're supposed to be. And not only that, this. The first thing we do is we erect barriers at the constitutional line that Jefferson told us. Constitutional line. 18 powers, Article 1, Section 8. 18 powers, the rest of the document. The powers of the president, the powers of the court. That's the line. That's the line. And so we actually establish that in our statute and say, here are the powers that were delegated to you, period, the end. So we draw the line first thing. Second thing we do is our Constitutional Defense Council now reviews and evaluates all federal action. Agency action, legislation, executive orders against that line. Now, in, in addition, if they cross that line, we fire off the letter and say, hey, Mr. Salazar, you crossed that line. We don't see anywhere in the document that gave you the authority to do that, and you've done this, 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 and this. Would you please let us know within whatever period of time what you intend to do about that? Because this is serious to us. So this, it, says, it says a correspondence would be open. Committees of correspondence was the remedy that they, that they used. And you would have a direct conduit with other state legislatures. We have things like ALEC and NCSL, these, these third-party organizations where legislators meet and they have kind of advice and that sort of thing. Well, there's nothing to say that we can't have a conduit directly. And so when our Constitutional Defense Council is meeting, we have a conduit directly with other legislators. And so when we send our letter, we get five and 10 and 15 and 20 other letters coming at the same time. Hey, we really meant this. What if they don't? Then we take the next step. Oh, by the way, while we're doing that, we call upon our federal delegation. We have the 17th Amendment, but big deal. That doesn't mean we can't call on our federal delegation to advise us of agency action, legislation, executive orders that cross the line. And that doesn't mean we can't call upon them when we send that letter to help run interference with those departments in Washington. Next step, next step is we, we call it, they, 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 they blow that off. We're hoping for change and it doesn't pan out. They're not acting in good faith. Now we have much more information than we had before we started. We know exactly how we're dealing with each other, whether we're acting in good faith or not. We go to the next step. We sent the letter to you. 
30 days, 45 days, whatever has gone by, we haven't seen any action from you. We would like you to receive an official delegation from the state of Utah so that we can sit down and talk about this before this goes any further. And oh, by the way, we've got 20 buddies that want to be part of that as well. We're still hoping for change, right? We're still hoping for change. Think of the power in the process. Do you guys have any idea out of 1,000 cases that are filed in court, how many go to trial? Probably less than 10. It's about 1% of cases go to trial. Why? They work themselves out along the process for any number of reasons. For any number of reasons. There's power in the process. There's power in the process of 20 states standing at that line saying, we really mean it. If they still blow that off, the Constitutional Defense Council will report quarterly to the Government Ops Committee, Government Operations Committee, and annually to every legislator. Because, as James Madison said, our state legislatures will jealously and closely watch the operations of this government and be able to resist with more effect every assumption of power, get this, better than any power on earth can do. Better than the Supreme Court. Better than any power on earth can do because they are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. That's our job. That's why we swear that oath. So they blow it off. Constitutional Defense Council comes back to every legislator and says, you've tasked us with watching and building the record of every instance in which the federal government crosses that line. We've been on the job. Here's a list of 623 instances in which the federal government has crossed that line. Now, legislature, that is the sure guardian of the people's liberty, now you can decide what to act and what to do. We have to diagnose before we prescribe. There's also power in educating our legislators and our legislature as a body. We can be that guy, but I think much better for Utah. Do you realize we're the most charitable people in the United States of America by more than double the national average? We know hard work in Utah. We know sacrifice in Utah. We know kindness in Utah. Here's my challenge to you. In addition to your homework, I, I would ask you to know where's the line. I would invite you to write a date. Write a date by when you are going to have enough confidence that you know where the line is. It comes from right here. It comes from the Federalist Papers. It comes from many, many other good books. If you need a list, I'll be happy to help, but I know you've got plenty of people to help you with that. Write a date and write what you're going to do to know where the line is personally. How about 10 people that you can share and help them understand where the line is? Just 10, right? 10 becomes 100, 100 becomes 1,000. You all know who your representatives are, right? Do you know the others? And have you asked them, where's the line? Do you know where the line is? Are you still, are you still dwelling under that misapprehension that checks and balances means only what you learned in eighth grade executive, legislative, judicial, or do you understand why you take that oath under Article 6? Why you are the sure guardian of my liberty? Why you are supposed to jealously and closely watch the operations of this government and be able to resist every assumption of power better than any power on earth can do? Fourth one, um, if you can help, if you can become invested in where's the line in any way, in time, in talent, in resources, I, I feel no shame in begging for your help in that. Let me leave you with these words. Ronald Reagan, in 1987, I believe it, uh, 1985 actually, I believe it's more true for our day than in his. He said, this is a wonderful time to be alive. We're lucky not to live in pale and timid times. We have been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something. For liberty and freedom and fairness, and these are things worth fighting for. Worth devoting our lives to. So let us go forth with good cheer and stout hearts, happy warriors, out to seize back a country and a world to freedom. I believe Utah can be the model of what it means to be self-reliant and free to the United States of America. Thank you so much for letting me come and be with you tonight. <laughs>